we were at a more competitive price point than more, you know, better uh, capitalized competitors. Yeah. And so they were like, you've got the colors I want. The quality is as good as anybody. And I, I'm not paying as much. Like, as long as you guys are... What's not to love? In 2016, I co-founded a drinkware company called Simple Modern. I was obsessed with the question, what would happen if we built a for-profit company focused on generosity? This podcast is a behind-the-scenes look at how we scaled from a bootstrapped startup to nine figures in annual revenue. We'll share with you the strategies we used, things learned along the way, and how we built a different type of company. This is Scaling for Good. Welcome back to Scaling for Good. I'm Mike Beckham, your host. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Simple Modern. One of my favorite sports is basketball, and I love following the NBA. Over the last 10 or 15 years, as analytics has played a bigger and bigger role in the NBA, one of the things that's become coveted by general managers across the league is players who can play multiple positions. It gives a team flexibility, different ways of attacking the defense that make them really hard uh, to defend and contain. On any team, it's exceptionally helpful when you have somebody who can play multiple roles and do it well and transition to different parts of the team depending on the needs of the company. Today, I'm excited to have somebody with us that has done that for Simple Modern. I'm joined by Chris Hoyle, who currently is our chief marketing officer. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Mike. Chris, why don't we start out by just hearing some of your background before Simple Modern? So um, I have been in consumer packaged goods for over a decade and um, have been, I was with uh, companies like Cadbury and then Kraft and then Ferrara Candy selling to Walmart and Sam's Club doing um, shopper marketing, sales, uh, those kinds of things. And so uh, had a lot of history uh, in sales primarily and some data analytics um, and then um, when you and I connected, uh, it, there was an opportunity to be a part of a company that was just getting off the ground and thought, you know, what a, what a great way to, you know, learn new skills, try new things. I'd been in, you know, Fortune 500, you know, billion dollar companies like, OK, let's see what it looks like to start uh, from the ground up. And so um, was excited to bring, you know, that experience to Simple Modern. So when we first started talking about an opportunity with Simple Modern, the the role that was open was a kind of head of sales, mm -hmm. chief sales officer, yeah. you know, something like that. And as you mentioned, you had sold a lot mm -hmm. of mainly candy yep. to Walmart. How many how many <laughs> uh, you know pounds, millions oh, of dollars worth of candy do you think you had sold to Walmart? I have no. I mean, definitely, I'm. It's got to be hundreds of millions of pounds oh of, my gosh. of candy. So, so to the how world. much of the world's diabetes problem do you think you personally? I don't think that I can be uh, tagged with a lot of it, but <laughs> certainly in North America, a, a good amount, uh, at least yeah. a quarter of it. Yeah. So anyway, you had been, you had obviously gotten really good at selling into those kind of contexts and. Uh, when we were starting to talk, I had gotten some meetings with mass retailers. In fact, we'd even landed a couple of programs, which um, I didn't realize this. You know, I, I knew so little mm -hmm. that I didn't even understand that what we had been able to accomplish up until that point was, you know, just didn't happen. Yeah. I remember that being one of the first things you yeah. told me, like, hey, this this just does not happen. I don't yeah. know how you did yeah, this. I, you know, I still, don't. I still, I mean, the, the idea that a, a retailer the size of Sam's Club you know, would make the kind of commitment they made with, with a, with a startup. I just thought, wow, like, I don't know what you said in that meeting, but that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned this at the beginning of the episode. Really, I think one of the things that stands out about you is tremendous growth mindset versatility, right? That you really can, uh, succeed and thrive in a lot of different places in the organization. So you came in and worked in this role where you were basically leading up sales, mm -hmm. helped us to get into Target, which yep. was a massive yep. coup for the brand at that point. This would have been like 2017. And really just as you were hitting your stride, yep. I came to you and asked you to switch jobs. Mm -hmm. Why? Well, I, we were getting to a place where we were just getting too big um, to to manage it because you were kind of leading everybody and doing yeah. everything. I was still wearing like you were the head recruiter yeah, hat you and head of HR of yeah. in addition to all this other stuff, yeah. which just didn't make sense anymore. No, and so, and we were getting to a size where it was like, 
we need some some structure in place. We need some processes in place. We need uh, somebody else to be in charge of hiring because we're going to need to be hiring. And so, um, yeah, you came and you were like, hey, I, I think that with your experience in, in, in these bigger companies, uh, et cetera, um, can you kind of take that, that role? I mean, I, it was, it was, I think chief operations officer, but it was really, we came up with that name cause it was like, I don't know what we call this. It's yeah. going to yeah. be a little bit of everything. And so, um, yeah, that was a, that was a great time, um, for me again to like try something new stretch, um, and put into practice a lot of the things I had been reading. Cause I love, I love leadership. I love, uh, I, I do love reading. And so it was an opportunity to think through, okay, how, you know, and, and you, you and the founders had already set, you know, this is the kind of company we're going to build. Yeah. You know, this is, this is what we're going to do, but some of it was, wasn't, you know, on paper yet. Yeah. And so, um, you know, that was part of my role was to help us all think through, okay, what exactly is the mission? You know, what are our values? I mean, we had, you know, uh, excellence and generosity were, were values from the very beginning. It was like, okay, mm -hmm. is that enough? And so, um, it was, it was such a fun role and time to think through what kind of people are we hiring? You know, what are we hiring for? Um, you know, all those, sorts what are of we, things. what are we going to be about? And can yeah. we really codify that? Yeah. So one of the things about you, and this is one of the reasons why I think you do have such a really exceptional growth mindset is that you are a voracious reader and you learn a lot from the experiences mm -hmm. of other people. Mm -hmm. You're constantly telling me about a new book that yeah. you've gone through and your takeaways, you take notes, you're, you're deliberate and intentional. I, I think that's something that I've picked up from you. I was not reading uh, nearly as much as I do now. I, mm -hmm. And even now I don't really, you know, physically read it. I, I do audio books mm -hmm. uh, because I have terrible eyesight, but, uh, <laughs> It's, it's a habit that I picked up from you, and I've seen how you constantly have a lot of inputs. It's one of the reasons why you have a lot of fresh ideas. When you stepped into the role, we were probably about 15 people, yeah. and we pretty quickly doubled the organization. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it was like we'd gone quite a few months without even hiring somebody, and it, we'd gotten to the point where it was just kind of absurd that we hadn't hired yeah people that we had under hired mm -hmm. uh, and then you came in in a matter of months we we basically doubled the yeah. organization yeah. what'd you learn through that process um uh, people are the most important part of the organization that you cannot compromise on who you bring into the organization i mean especially when you're like 15 people like right. those first hires i felt great pressure uh, in a good way to like get the right people foundational and, hires and they were, and, and they're, they're still here and they're still cornerstones of what we're doing. And, uh, and so, yeah, so the, the people are the most important thing. And two, um, uh, an interview is helpful, but, um, prior work experience, uh, track record, track record and like talking to people that they, that worked with them and even getting to work with people are, there's no substitute for that whenever you're trying to hire. If there's a, if there's a way to have somebody work on a project before they hire you, you know, you hire them, you know, have them do it. Like, cause right. you just interviews are, are really helpful and they're a, a, an important piece of it because you do learn a lot, but, um, you just can't go on just that because you can miss people. And this is what the research says. The research yeah. says that what we end up doing when we primarily base things off of interviews is that we look at, you know, we get over, over indexed on physical characteristics. We hire people that are taller, that are better mm -hmm. looking, mm -hmm. people that are more extroverted, that present better in person. And none of those things have high correlation yeah. to better work output yeah. that we just end up hiring people that present better, mm -hmm. but not necessarily that are going yep. to be better for the role. And that's where I think previous track record matters. One other thing I want to call out, yep. and then really the majority of this uh, conversation we're going to have is actually going to be about marketing, okay. which is your current role. Mm -hmm. But I, I do want to hear, you You mentioned this, when you came into the COO role, I think one of your big convictions was we have a lot of ideas of what we want the company mm -hmm. to be about. And we talk pretty openly about this. Those existed from day one, yep. but we had not really crystallized those mm -hmm. and we hadn't codified them. We hadn't yep. put them on paper yep. and you were dead set that this was a thing we needed to do. We had to do. Uh -huh. I was kind of rolling my eyes in the sense that I felt like, well, everybody gets it. Everybody knows what we're about. Why do we have to do this? 
but you really pushed me that, hey, this was something to do. Why was this such an important thing for us to, a step for us to take as a company? Yeah, I mean, I had, uh, again, seen a lot of different businesses and asked questions of their founders. What what was it that, you know, did it for, for you? Like, what was it that... Um, was foundational to success as a business. And it, it kept coming back that we were really clear on mission, vision, and values. Um, I'd read a number of books on it. Um, uh, the Culture Solution by Matthew Kelly, it, it, it really hammered that point home. And he had so many examples. I really admired uh, the business that Chick-fil-A had built. I really admired the way that culture and that was one of the core things you'd ask me to do is like, let's really, let's really, you know, be focused on the culture. So I was like, who's really concerned about it? And I read two or three books on, on Chick-fil-A. And then, uh, there was a couple of books from Netflix, mm-hmm. um, that were really helpful. And all of those folks were saying, you, even if you feel like everyone knows what it is, you got it, you've got to get it down early in the company so that people don't waver whenever, you know, decisions get hard. And, and I just thought everything they're saying is exactly like what we want and we've got to fight for it. And we've got to make sure that it's written down so that in five years, when you're not talking to everybody as much as you, you know, you were able to early on that we all know exactly what is the, here it is. This is, this is what we're about. Um, and we're going to live it. Um, but you have to have it on paper and, and it just, it was, it was really fantastic. And it's, it's the way that we evaluate, you know, at the end of the year is it's how we evaluate people, like how aligned are you with our values? And, and, and that's the feedback that people get. And Mm -hmm. so there's all kinds of ways. I'm proud of the way that we have, have, have kept to that, um, seven years later that the mission is still exactly what we're about. Everybody would say that it's what we're about. And, um, and people know I'm either doing a good job or not doing a good job yep. based on how aligned I am with the values of this company. And I think that's, I think it's great. I, I think it was a huge win for, for the company. And right as you got to the point of being very comfortable in that role, mm-hmm. I did it again. Yeah, thanks. I can't, exactly. <laughs> I'm very good at this. Chris, I want you to really throw your heart and soul into something. And then right when you feel like you're hitting your stride. Yeah. But, you know, the reality was that, I, I needed you in a different role because we had grown as an organization. We'd grown sales at this point. I think when I, when I approached you, we were probably in the 60, 70, $80 million mm-hmm. in sales. So we, we definitely got into some scale and we, we had a great solution in leading up sales. Yeah. And I felt like there were other people you had really established. I had kind of taken the baton for a while. You'd taken the baton for a while. We'd established the type of person mm-hmm. we were looking for, the type of culture we were aiming for. Um, but what we did not have built internally was really a marketing creative machine mm-hmm. that to, to run a consumer brand, you have to be strong in these areas. And we just had way under invested mm-hmm. in building out those capabilities And so I was kind of faced with a a decision that I could either go outside of the organization and try to find someone that had a lot of experience doing these things and bring them in as as kind of an expert, or I could hire internally. And uh, my preference has always been to promote internally. I think if, if you want to attract really top leaders and you want to retain top leaders, then they need to be able to see that they're going to be able to advance within the organization. And I've always felt like if I can avoid it, I want to avoid going out to get that person. Mm -hmm. We've done it in certain situations. So I started looking internally and thinking, who's the person that, that could lead this? And I think the combination of you having done some things in the kind of customer marketing realm, combined with the fact that you just shown an amazing growth mindset that I could plug you into a new situation and you could very quickly um, pick up a lot of the skills and fundamentals because, uh, because you, you do read so much and and you do have such a desire to grow. You do often get together for breakfast with people, you know, in the industry and uh, leaders in the business world just to pick their brain and just Mm -hmm. to to learn. And so I approached you about becoming the chief marketing officer. Uh, when you were first approached with the opportunity, what were your thoughts? I was, uh, I was humbled. I mean, by the idea that you would think I could do something else. Um, I, I, 
I, I shared it with a family member and, and he was like, uh, are you sure that they're not sure what to do with you? And this isn't one step from getting rid of you. Yeah. And I said, I don't think so, but you could be onto something. Um, but so I, I thought, I thought, um, what a great challenge. Um, this is, it's been kind of, uh, tangential to things I have been doing for a really long time. I right. worked with marketing a lot, you know, uh, when I was in sales and when you're on the Walmart team, you, you, you have, a, there's a lot of interaction between marketing and had done shopper marketing, which is more like in the store kinds of marketing. So like was familiar with, you know, marketing concepts, et cetera. But so was, uh, was excited, was nervous, was, um, was thinking, you know, I, you know, this company is heading towards, uh, being a, a really big company. So I've, I've got a lot of work to do if I'm going to become the right leader, uh, for a long time, uh, in this role. And so got to work at like learning as much as I could about what does it take to lead a marketing organization? What are the things that you need to know? What are the things that, you know, need to be true of your marketing? Um, what, you know, what, what is, what needs to be true about, what you understand about the customer, what your messaging is, how are you going to tell, like all those sorts of things. Like I got to go, I got to go to school on all this stuff because yeah. now it's like, I'm going to be giving direction uh, and not just kind of taking what other people you know, had, had come up with and then, and then applying it to my retailer. Now it was like, no, no, now it's like, you need to work with your team and you're going to be providing that sort of leadership. And so, um, yeah, it was, it was an exciting time um, that I, you know, three years later, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm just as excited and, and need to learn just as much as I did back then. So, so now you are the chief marketing officer for Simple Modern. We are a brand that does nine figures in revenue, mm -hmm. and you're stepping into the role. The very first thing is you were determined to really know our customer yep. inside and out. Yeah, I remember you telling me like I can't be effective in this role if I don't understand our customer and and kind of crawl inside their mind. Yep. So how did you go about that process of of starting to really understand our customer on a deep level? Yeah, I mean, uh, I am not I'm not a creative person. Like I'm not going to be creating um, designs, et cetera. And so when I when I got into the role, it was like okay, the value I bring here is quality of thought on what we're going to do, who the customer is, how we're going to talk to them. And so I was like, I don't know. I mean, so I started with like looking at reviews, Amazon reviews to understand how people thought about uh, products because um, that was a data available to us. And then pretty quickly just got into focus groups. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a number, you know, we had tens of, at that point, tens of thousands of people that were signed up for email. So reached out uh, to folks and just said, and, and this was uh, still in the middle of COVID. So wasn't trying to do anything in person, but was able to, through Zoom, have many different so it was literally just talking to customers yeah i just on said Zoom. you know here's i will offer you a free water bottle if you'll be a part of a focus group and just give us an hour of your thoughts on the brand you know why do you buy etc what do you what do you capture in a conversation like that that's not going to come through from doing a survey or, or something a little bit higher well, level uh well, I didn't, I hadn't even done a survey at this point because I wasn't sure even, you didn't even know what to ask. I wasn't a hundred percent sure what to ask. And so it was like, I wanted to get a sense of, uh, you know, the, the, the kinds of questions we ask at that point, I really want to understand why are you buying? What right. do you, what do you think about the brand? Does brand play into it at all? Um, cause we, we have some opinions on why we think you're probably buying. Um, and so it was like uh, asking other questions like, if, if simple modern had a radio station, what do you think would be played on it? Mm. You know, do, are you buy who all are you buying for? Are you buying for your husband and your kids? Cause, cause, cause we could see in, in the Google analytics that, you know, women were our primary, you know, purchaser, but want to understand who was using it, how were they using it? Um, all those sorts of things and got so much information. You know, the biggest thing that we learned early was our mission uh, most people don't know what it is Yep. at that point. That was like three, three years ago. Like most people don't know what the mission is and it is just a nice to have. And where yeah. we were thought this is maybe like one of the bigger reasons they're buying from us. Uh, but really it came down to quality style uh, and value. And it was like, okay, that's, that's what we're hearing. And so then did uh bigger pause there. Yep. I want to talk about okay. that for a little yep. bit because uh, you know, it was, it was a period where we were trying to understand 
what are our distinctives? Mm-hmm. How do we really emphasize how we're different than, yep. than our competitors? And we really felt like our commitment to generosity was both what, what made us special mm-hmm. uh, and what made us different. Yep. And I think your research was really helpful in the sense that we needed to understand what customers wanted to hear from mm-hmm. us. I, I teach at OU and I work with a lot of students that are entrepreneurship majors and they are coming up with business ideas. And to a lot of them, what we've done with Simple Modern is kind of a beacon of hope. Like they're like, this is the type of business I want to build. Unfortunately, what that can lead them to do is come up with these business models where it's almost like they start with, who do I want to give money to? Mm -hmm. And then let me throw a business model on top Mm -hmm. of that. And I've really had to emphasize that is just not how the market works. Mm -hmm. I mean, we talk a lot in this podcast throughout the episodes about our culture and about giving. And although they are integral to how the company runs, and I think what makes the company special most customers, they do not want that to be our lead foot. And and even some customers just don't care. Yeah. They want to know about the product mm-hmm. first and foremost. Mm-hmm. And I think we had to really kind of come to grips with that and understand, yeah. okay, what is it that customers want to know? Why are they purchasing us? What makes us special in their eyes? And instead of what is the story we want to tell, what is the story that customers need to hear yep. in order to connect with the brand? Yeah, 100%. You know, um, yeah, we we uh, did follow up surveys where we sent it to a few thousand people and got feedback. I think the very first survey, the big survey, we did had seven hundred people, and that was totally consistent. Everything we heard in the survey was totally consistent with what we heard in the focus groups. And so it was like, okay, I think we've got, I think we've got, we understand who you know who we are, who our customer is, how do they see us, why are they buying us. Um, and, and then, you mentioned it, but you say it again. What was that intersection where yeah, it was, we it was, really did well? It was style. Uh, so what does style well, mean? So, so style was the look. And so... Uh, Why does was, that matter to customers? Yeah. So this was something that you uh, really caught on early uh, in our company was that uh, people think about drinkware as an accessory, like they would shoes or a purse. And so we were we were offering at that time, I think between 15 and 20 colors on Amazon, when most folks were doing maybe four or five colors. Mm-hmm. Um, that may not be true, but that's how I remember it, uh, that we were by far had the most colors and people really we're able and we're, we're a very affordable, you know, luxury. And so people were able to, to buy different colors, um, to match. And so that was important to them. Quality was number one. They were like, your product, um, keeps my drinks cold for 24 hours. It's, I mean, they, they really thought we were putting magic into it that like, yeah. you know, cause this was, this was early, early enough that, you know, th- you know, double wall vacuum insulated, you know, drinkware was, it was just like crazy. It keeps it yeah. cold. I, I go to bed and there's ice in my cup and, you know, the next morning. And that was, uh, that was the number one reason. And, and then, and then even though we didn't talk about it, uh, and we haven't talked about ourselves as a value brand, but like, we were at a more competitive price point than more, you know, better, uh, capitalized competitors. And so they were like, you've got the colors I want. The quality is as good as anybody. And I'm I'm not paying as much. Like as long as you guys are, what's not to love, as long as there's that formula, like I'm going to keep buying, like you keep doing that in other categories. And people have said that, you know, it's like, cause we, that was other things we asked them, like what would be, you know, innovation that you would, you know, be willing to consider from us. And, uh, and anything along those lines around, um, style, quality, and value has done really well. Today's episode is brought to you by The Van Group. About a year ago, we decided it was time to update the Simple Modern website. We desired to create a look that elevated our brand while keeping a focus on performance and speed. We talked to many other business owners for a list of recommendations, and after talking to several potential partners, we chose to work with The Van Group. Over the past several months, we have been working closely with the Van team on building and launching our new website. To kick things off, the team at Van did a fantastic job of gathering our input and walking us through a proven process to create a winning product. Van Group has developed a proprietary brand conversion design framework. Using this strategy, Van is able to deliver highly creative and performant websites that don't compromise on brand and improve the bottom line. In our experience, we've been impressed by their deep knowledge, creativity, and collaboration. 
Once our new website launched, the team at VAM worked tirelessly to address issues and to make data-driven improvements. For all these reasons, I'm very happy to advocate for the VAN Group and their outstanding team. You can learn more by visiting their website, thevangroup.com. There's been this combination of forces that have helped the company to be successful and, you know, survivorship bias is a real thing. Mm -hmm. It is so easy when you've made it and things have gone well yeah. to say, well, let me tell the story about how smart we are and right. how we did all the right things, pushed all the right buttons. And although that's a story I would love to believe, it's mm -hmm. probably not accurate. Yeah. The reality is that we've had probably the intersection of good fortune, mm -hmm. some good strategic insight, and then some tailwinds that just happened from being in the right place at the right, right. time. Uh, obviously, the being in the right place at the right time, our category has become, it's just become a massive category. Yeah. If you look across hard lines uh, in, in housewares, like it's the best category you could have been in mm -hmm. over the last seven or eight years. Yeah. And so some of that is like, we just... We just are in the right place at the right time. Yep. And I would be the first to say that. Yep. And not only that, but we really chose to focus on Amazon during a period where Amazon won huge. Yeah. You know, I've I've made the joke before that 30 years from now, it really felt impressive to us to build the company, but 30 years from now, people might look at the case study of Simple Water and be like, well, of course those guys, you know, got really big. They were in drinkware on Amazon. Like, <laughs> exactly. how could they, you know, you, yeah. you have to be an idiot yeah. to not become big. Yeah. But one place where I do think it mattered, the insight that we had, is we really believed that drinkware could become a more fashion-driven mm -hmm. category. Mm -hmm. And I think that's been the mega trend. The yeah. mega trend has been that this is an accessory mm -hmm. that people do think about, hey, how do I buy a water bottle where the color matches my mm -hmm. dress or I have a different looking one for when I go to the gym yep. versus when I'm at my, my desk in my office versus, you know, when I'm on the go or, or whatever else. And that once we realize that and we realize that, or I think we had that theory that thesis very early on in the mm -hmm. company and we just have progressively learned leaned into it yep. and one of the reasons why this is worth highlighting is it's one thing to say hey style is a huge part of why people are buying mm -hmm. but you are walking into a marketing role where it's all about convincing people to buy our product based on style if you don't have a really robust product pipeline mm -hmm. where you are constantly bringing mm -hmm. new looks and new designs yep. and new styles to the market, you're you're going to be dead in the water. Yep. Right. Like there's yeah. only so much you can do with creative, you know, but if you don't actually have mm -hmm. the assets, you don't mm -hmm. actually have a lot of different looks that you can show to people. It's going to be very difficult for you to succeed if style is and fashion is one of the mega trends in your category. Yeah, we we were we we had a creative director that was really great on staying on trends. Yep. She really understood you know, this idea and like what people were looking for. And, um, and then just as a company, we just value, uh, testing things. And so we just, we have, I mean, uh, sometimes on Slack, people will post old ornamentations we try and they're like, ha, look at this, you yeah. know, and it's like, yeah, that is funny now. But like at the time it was like, we didn't know if, if, if that thing that looked like a Pollock, you know, painting was going to work or not because, um, Cause you know, it, it looked pretty cool and it was different and it, it didn't work. Um, but, and then, uh, but now we've got new products that kind of remind me of those, you right. know, the terrazzo items that, you know, are, are have that kind well, of splatter look and fashion, you just don't know. With fashion, what is in today yeah. at 1.4 years ago was really out. Yeah. And so almost no matter what you try, it's like, if you just wait long enough, it probably will be on trend mm -hmm. and it will be, I mean, I don't know. There was a terrible brown that we called Java Brown that we did and, and maybe that <laughs> never is going to be in I style. don't know if that ever really pops. Right. But, I, I don't uh, know what the demographic is that's going to ever But really we know because yeah, we tried it. We did try you know what I mean? and but i think that attitude is certainly part of yeah. what's made it successful yeah. and obviously this is a big part of being successful in marketing is that you don't know what's going to resonate right. you don't know what ad what creative right. what video what what hook is going to really engage <clears throat> mm -hmm. people so you have to have a willingness to experiment and test a lot of things that requires a team mm -hmm. and a process yep. 
How did you go about building a team to be able to make the enormous amount of creative assets that an organization like this requires at its scale? Yeah, I mean, I, I, we talked about it earlier. It's all about the people. I mean, we just had the early, you know, um, Hillary Barnett was our, our creative director and she has high capacity. She was able to produce a lot. Aaron Jesse was our first uh, graphic designer. He was able just to crank out a ton of, of, of different things. And so it really, I mean, we could have had the best process that the marketing world had ever seen. But if we hadn't had those kinds of talented, hardworking, committed people, I don't think it would have worked. But, but we, um, you know, we, we just, we use, we do have processes. We, we use a tool called Asana mm -hmm. and we get out ahead of it and we have, you know, uh, you know, we have campaigns and then we have subtasks where it's like, you know, we need this Clear many, calendar. this many creatives where, you know, uh, for this, we're looking out, you know, uh, our, our company is moving really rapidly. And so we're looking out about 45 to 60 days. Um, okay. like we're not, getting too far ahead of ourselves because things change so rapidly, but we're, we're, we're probably six weeks out. Um, and just making sure that everyone knows. And now at this point, it's like, okay, if we have a new product, we know there's photography that's going to have to happen yep. in a studio. We know there's going to have to be lifestyle photography. We're going to maybe do some, some studio work where it is more stylized in a studio. And then we've got other people that are going to use that and create emails that are going to go out to people that have signed up for emails. And then we've got people creating social ads. You know, we had a, and we're, we're constantly evolving on this. I mean, just yesterday we had a meeting, um, with half the team where we're just looking at ads and we're thinking through how do we, uh, cause we, we launched a lot of new products this summer. And so how many new products did we launch this summer? I, I don't even know it, it, it from, Seven, eight, from eight. April to, um, through August, it was probably, 10 or 12 yeah. of varying sizes. Yeah. Uh, and if you include, we, we have both product launches where it's like, Hey, this is a new, you know, this is a new lid or a new yeah. type of water bowl. Uh, we had things where we got into totally new categories. Yep. This is a tote. This yep. is a beach bag. Yep. And then we had a lot of things where it's like, Hey, now we're doing Harry Potter. Yep. Now we're doing, you know, Marvel or yep. whatever, where it was licensing based where, so there were a lot of different yep. needs for a lot creative. of needs. And, and, and one thing that you can't do when, when you're launching this many is, is get super, um, concerned about every pixel. Did I get that pixel right? Did I did yeah. is that shade of that email just right? I mean, Which like, creatives can do. You can do that. You can do that. Sure. I, I have I think that has been part of my role is to is to help us not do that where it's like I know you guys want to make this where if if you put this in your portfolio that you could, you know, that everyone would be amazed. But like it's we've got there's got to be a balance here between yeah. like what really represents the product and the brand well and what's perfect and and so a lot of times I've had to be the, Hey, that, that I, you may not think so, but that's amazing. Like let's, let's ship it. I think managing creatives, it, you, you're not a creative, right? You know, I'm, I'm not, uh, I this appreciate is not an insult. Uh, that. <laughs> this is just like, you know, in a personality 100%, 100%, test, you would not test out as a creative. 100%. You would test out as somebody who's very good at developing processes yep. and organizing people. And I think you've done that, but obviously the people that you're working with are primarily yep. creatives. For sure. And I, I think that I've seen this really commonly people, People, more business minded people struggling to work well with creatives uh -huh. because the, their way of processing the world is so different. Yeah. And you mentioned this, but to a creative, they get a vision in their mind of what could be the way that that, yep. that picture could look or yep. the video could come out. And it's very frustrating. There's a lot of dissonance mm -hmm. when they're not able to recognize yep. that vision. Yep. And it can be really difficult to be, if you're creative, to be asked mm -hmm. to, hey, I know that's not, you didn't get to your vision, but it's good enough. Mm -hmm. And now we need to move on to the next thing because mm -hmm. we have another, you know, thing coming. Yeah. How do you do that? How do you balance helping them to do their best work, but then knowing when it's time to move on, even though they could continue to tweak and perfect, you know, uh, that picture or that video? Yeah. I think, uh, what one thing that's been helpful is uh, casting a vision for where the company's going. Mm -hmm. it, Cause I think that it, it can be uh, tempting to want to say this thing that I'm working on right now is the most important thing that we're going to work on all year, but it, it is just going to be one of the most important things. So I think it's, it's constantly reminding folks 
this is where we're going. Like this is like this. You're going to get a lot of wax at the. Pinata. You're going to yeah. It's yeah. like if you don't love if you don't love this one, apply apply what you want to do to the right. next one. And so I think it's continually, you know, just keeping people's eyes up and not down is, is one of the most important things. Um, and I think uh, for me and for the creatives, I have found asking them, what are you, what are you trying to achieve here? Right. Like before I would give any feedback or, 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 or push too much on anything. It's like, what are you trying to achieve? And like really talk through and it's like, do we need that or not? Cause sometimes it is like, okay, that is worth taking that extra hour or two hours to make that happen. But sometimes like, I hear what you're trying to achieve, but I don't know that on this one, we yeah. need to necessarily achieve that. And we don't so, even know where we'd find five giraffes for that shot. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Where it's yeah. like, it, you can easily, yeah. you know, in pursuit of that perfect yeah. picture or whatever, like the, the time, the cost uh, can just blow out and helping them to be realistic. Yeah. And about, show an appreciation. Yep. You know, I, I think just, just show an appreciation that I recognize what you want to do here yeah. and it's amazing, but we, we are going to have to like keep moving. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that helps. So you have to balance a lot of quantitative inputs mm -hmm. along with qualitative input. Yeah. I mean, creatives are mostly going to give you qualitative yeah. input. How do you balance those two things? I think, um, by testing things, by split testing, you, you don't have to, you, you can, you can keep more people happy because you're trying the thing that they want to try. You're not having to yeah. say no as much. Um, whenever you're like, let's just split test it. Yeah. Let's just split test. You, you're thinking this, some data is maybe saying this might be a better solution, but we don't know. Let's split test. And so I think testing constantly. And so, and that's, so that's what we do. We we're, we're always like when it comes to ornamentations, we're doing surveys where our customers are telling us what ornamentations do you like best? Do you like, you know, this kind of color and this kind of uh, look, or is it this? And that just helps immensely, you know, focus us on what we want to do. And so um, I think when it's not just, I think, but it's yes. like, we know this, it, it's really helpful. It's so easy to get into qualitative debates, especially yeah. with people that have a strong point of view yeah. as creatives often do, yeah. uh, where, like you said, it's, it devolves into, I think, or yeah. I feel, yeah. you know, I feel like this would be best. I feel like our customer really right. wants to see this, or I feel like this would be the same thing we did mm -hmm. last time. And to be able to say, okay, in order for us to have unity mm -hmm. and cohesiveness of purpose and work together as a team, we have to be able to use something objective yep. to, to get aligned. Yep. And I think you've done a really good job at saying, hey, we're going to allow our customer yep. and our customer's feedback to help give us the data where we, mm -hmm. we don't just have a bunch of I feel, I think yep. conversations, but where we combine our qualitative insights with what data has actually yep. shown us. A great yep. example of this is how we look at ornamentations mm -hmm. and the way that we come up with new ornamentations. Yep. You want to walk through that? Yeah. So uh, w like I mentioned, we've got uh, Hillary's in charge of, of ornamentations and she's looking at trends. She's, she's, she, and she does a great job of this, of getting a sense of like, a, wh where is the market going to be in 12 months? And so she will put together hundreds of different designs and we, they get put in, you know, survey software. It goes out to a bunch of customers and we, we start to rank, you know, where, you know, these ornamentations are going to be. And so we get a lot of data in that way, but I, I, there still is, there are choices that have to be made because it's like sometimes ornamentations are close to each other. So like, where do we truly get incrementality and we don't have spend dollars or maybe we're, we're trying to, you know, think of, or, you know, we need new designs on Amazon. It's like, or a partner, like we're working with a licensing sure. partner. That's like, Hey, we really want this property included, yep. even though it doesn't survey very right. well. And that's part of the contract. There's always considerations that are, you have to kind of stack on top of yeah. the feedback from customers. And sometimes buyers will, will make choices, but so that's the process that we, we, we'll get in a room and we, we look at the rankings of all this and we have to make decisions on what, where's their incrementality? Where is their, um, like feasibility, like, can we actually execute on this like new style of thing? Um, so ornamentations is a great place. Another place where testing has been really fantastic this year, we've done more of it this year is, uh, around our email marketing where it's like, how long does it, does it need to be? How short does it need to be? Where does the call to action need when to be? When does it go out? When does it go out? What should the subject like, like right. all how those big, kinds how, of you know, things. What percentage of our list do we send to? And yeah. we, and that we had been, 
with a lot of like, I think that, you know, people aren't going to actually get all the way down if an email is that mm-hmm. long. Um, and so we just started testing stuff and figuring out, you know, are people clicking? When do they click? When do they buy? Uh, all those sorts of things. And it's been really helpful. And, and it honestly, instead of being stifling to the creatives has been, it's been great. Cause it's like, try stuff. Yeah. Try it. And what it does is it gives, it serves as a mirror and it gives them feedback yeah. of not just, Hey, what of your work do you, it looks good to you, yeah. but what of your work is the most effective? Yeah. And it gives them a signal of like, Oh, when I did X, that really resonated with yep. customers. Okay, well, I can lean into that yep. and I can learn from that. So it helps them to advance sure. in their career, yep. understanding how to be more effective, yep. which none of us can grow in our effectiveness mm-hmm. unless we get feedback on how well we're doing. Yep. And we and like you said, the combination of experimenting, yep. trying things, yep. and then getting feedback is a process that we all need, mm-hmm. whether we're trying to become better as a creative or mm-hmm. a public speaker or in leadership or planning or whatever you know category, shooting a basketball that yep. you talk about we need that feedback yeah so one of the things you do anybody you talk to any chief marketing officer there's a combination of using internal resources yeah. and external partners yeah we've used some external partners that have been really helpful for us along the way um as you know oklahoma is not the most scenic place right in the united states that's what i'm told it, it might be the second most scenic place <laughs> Um, but we have partners that are that are based out of places like California. Yeah. And so when we're doing photo shoots or uh, especially uh, video shoots, <clears throat> sometimes we've we've used partners because of geographic location sure. and different reasons. How do you think about when to do something in house versus when to outsource it to a partner? Yeah, I mean, uh, as far as uh, video goes, that that one's pretty easy because. Um, we don't have the same sort of, uh, structure for models, you know, here right. in Oklahoma, we just don't have the, the volume of folks that you might need or locations. And so for videos and, and we'll do videos for new products primarily, um, cause we need that, that sort of thing on Amazon or on our, uh, product detail pages on our website. So with videos, it's been, it's been pretty easy to know, um, that we need support and just to get an outside view. And so that that's been an easy decision as far as like things like ads or, or emails or, you know, uh, other sorts of creative resources that we need for our digital business. Um, that's where it's been harder. And I think for us, uh, going into, uh, 22, um, we, the, the business was, we were really starting to feel it on the mm-hmm. creative side mm-hmm. and we were having, um, the, the hiring in, in, in the creative space was going a little bit slower than the growth. And so it was like, okay, we have business imperatives that we have are going, we, they have to These get done. These products are launching they whether ha- or they not have to happen. the right candidate. They have to happen. And yeah. so, um, so then it was like, okay, we know that we're going to need outside resources to, to achieve our yeah. business goals. And so, um, th- you know, so, so just being able to, to service the business dictated us when we need it, because there has, there has been, uh, we, we have a really talented team, so we haven't had to go get a specific like skill set very often. Like we could do most things in house if we had, you know, more time, uh, you know, and, and maybe more people. Uh, and so, um, but video has been one of those things where yeah. we've known kind of early on that like we need help there just because of all that goes into that. And I think you captured this ESO ethos throughout the, our, our conversation, but you have a willingness to to do things and to learn. And so the combination of having talented people that want to learn mm-hmm. and grow and a willingness to learn and grow with them has meant that sometimes, sure, is there somebody out there who we could pay to do this at a B plus or an A minus level? Absolutely. Yeah. But internally, we could do it at a C plus or a B minus level today. And my team can learn and yeah. grow and we can expand our capabilities. Yeah. So we're going to do it internally. Mm-hmm. When when you have that internal uh, willingness to to test and to experiment and to allow people to grow into roles mm-hmm. that really increases the scope of what you can do internally. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, for sure. And, and we we have a in growth mindset is one of our core values, and and we hire on that. And so, really, all the people that we get have that. They they're not complacent. How do you measure how you're doing at your job? Uh, great question. Um, I think you know, obviously the sales of the company yeah 
are, I mean, I think all of us should look at, at that. I mean, it's the ultimate truth metric, right? I mean, it tells you, you know, uh, is that, is what you're doing resonating with people? Um, so that, that start there for sure. Uh, and then from there, um, look at things like, uh, Google trends, like, yeah. and, and Amazon search volume to understand. Yeah. Just wrote people, about that last night on Twitter. Uh, we, we look at both of those pretty Yeah, well, absolutely. So. And so it's like, it's awareness, you know, cause you think about what are the things, you know, how, how does, you know, marketing, uh, justify their existence. And obviously sales is number one, but also things like, you know, uh, brand awareness, brand affinity, net promoter score, mm -hmm. all those sorts of things go into, um, uh, whether or not people are, are we doing a good job of getting the message out there of knowing what the message is and then hitting the right people? And so uh, right now we're, we're seeing all those grow. And Everything's so green it, right it, now. It feels like that we are doing a good job. Uh, you know what we've been doing, we've done two, we've done it uh, like two different, like, uh, national, you know, national market, yeah. you know, surveys around brand awareness. Those have been very encouraging and then and, and trending up and even hearing, cause there, there are some qualitative questions and just hearing from those people saying, I saw you here. I, you know, I saw ads here and it's like, okay, that's, that's starting yeah. uh, to give us some feedback that, yeah, what we're doing is getting, making people aware of us and, and growing affinity. And so we see with net promoter score in the eighties and nineties that like, uh, I think one way that people can rate you lower on net promoter score is if they have an expectation of what something's going to be. If you and then over you don't hit your it. product. And so right, I feel like we're doing a good job of saying, this is what you should expect from us. And then what they get is higher than that. Yeah. And so um, that's been great. Yeah. I try that in my marriage all the time. Try and undersell yeah. what you're going to get. Here's what you should expect, sweetie. And then you're really happy with what yeah. you get. No, uh, in, in all seriousness, I, I think that that's absolutely accurate. And part of the challenge is once you do have quantitative numbers that tell you how you're doing, and in this case, we're in a year where things are going really well, mm -hmm. being able to deconstruct that and then you add the qualitative in and say, mm -hmm. okay, why do we think it's going that way? Yeah. And even looking at our competitors and saying, who's growing, who's shrinking? Why yeah. do we think that's yeah. happening? And that becomes the basis for not just our strategy in marketing, but also our strategy kind of across the business, yeah. what products we're going to release and everything else. So what's been the most challenging part in your mind of growing uh, the Simple Modern brand? Yeah, there, there is so much that has been easy about this because of, you know, market trends, et cetera. But challenges have been, um, you know, a lot of D2C companies, uh, primarily D2C companies, have built into their margin structure a lot of marketing because mm -hmm. that's how they're going to get customers is through digital marketing. And being omnichannel the way that we are, we are priced in a way and we, we're giving away 10% of profits to nonprofits, which we are super excited to do, but it makes it more challenging because you do have fewer resources when you're competing against these. Like if you're just thinking about the D to C part of the business, um, that makes it more challenging because you do have fewer resources to really try to get the message out there on new products. Etc. So we've had to be more creative on, you know, using, you know, things like Instagram own channels, kinds of things that are more affordable. And so, um, so that's been, that's been one challenge for sure. Um, I think an another challenge is, uh, that there's so much competition, um, finding the right message, finding the right, um, brand distinctive assets Differentiation. To, to, to stand out in a crowded market has yeah. been, has been a, a challenge, but one that it seems based on, you know, just market trends that we're, we're doing a pretty good job of competing. Um, and I think, um, another challenge is how do you marry the, the style quality value part of our brand mm -hmm. with the generosity piece. Um, mm -hmm. humility is a, a, you know, a value that we have. And so the idea that we're going to go around and beat our chest about the giving, um, is just, it's not, it's not what we're, it's not core to who we are. And so we've kind of shied away from that, but at the same time, that's one of the most compelling things about our brand. Once you, you get beneath the surface of like who we are. And so I think finding that right balance of, we do want people to know 
that, that we're the kind of company that's giving away and giving, you know, giving away money and product to, to worthy causes. We do want people to know that because we do know that that will encourage and inspire others to do the same. And, and we want to be an agent of change. And so like just being able to kind of bring together all of those different messages in a, in a cohesive way under the same umbrella is a challenge that I think this year in particular, we're thinking through, how do we do that? How do we tell the brand story while also um, having amazing products? And, you know, how, what's the balance Mm -hmm. there? You know, is it, is it 90, 10 that you talk about it? And then, and then also thinking through, you've got a lot of, uh, of elements, like when somebody buys a product, they, there's a box there. What do you communicate on the box? Like how much right. of it is product versus, you know, the brand story? You got inserts and other things. And so uh, I think all of that has been, you know, challenging to, to, to think through and to figure out, you know, how, yeah. how do you make those messages work? I mean, it, you're making a great point, which is to build a culture where we say we value humility. Mm-hmm. Self-promotion and humility feel like antonyms, Yeah, uh, but you have to do some Mm self-promotion. I mean, that's the game. You're building a brand and trying to convince people that that brand is valuable and that they should want to buy it. And so it's it's a a fine line to walk. Yeah. So we've been doing this for several years together. Uh, I'd love to hear what are a couple of your favorite memories from uh, the road this far? Early on in the company, we were able to do this more. We would have times of of affirmation where... We would, as an organization, and, and, and at that point, it was like between 10 and 20 people, yeah. um, and maybe even up to 30, we were doing this, but like, we were just giving time to, hey, we're going to affirm Mike today yeah, or, or, or somebody else 45 today. minutes, an hour, just going you, around a room, yeah, just sharing what we appreciated about somebody. Yeah. And it was like, what is it about them that you really admire? And And it wasn't... It wasn't performance based. Typically, yeah. like, it was very little of it had to do with Much their more business performance. Based. It was like I love that when I had this issue, they were there. Yeah. Um, I, I just look back at all those, and we we still and we do we do still do affirmations, and I love it. But now it's like it's just it's a it's a few people that do it, and we write it out, and um, it's really meaningful for people um, to be affirmed by their colleagues, and so. That I, you know, it, whenever I got affirmed, just a really great memory thinking about specific memories of just hearing people appreciate things and, yeah. and that, that, that I'm so thankful that we've got that as a company. And I think that's a really, uh, uncommon, I think those mm-hmm. happen in places. I think they probably happen in every company, but it's one person saying, I see this about you, mm-hmm. but we're like, we're willing to take an hour we think this is important enough for you to know how we feel about you. Yeah. And it's just, uh, it's really impactful. Well, when we do it today, uh, we'll usually do a few people and uh, someone will go out and gather feedback from several of their close coworkers. And then we turn it into a document actually that mm-hmm. gets read. Yep. And, uh, but you're also presented at the end of that, you're presented with like a framed version of mm-hmm. that document. And if you go around our office, one of the things you'll see in mm-hmm. almost every office yeah. in the company is that somebody will have their affirmation document yeah. of all the things people have said about them because mm-hmm. it really is meaningful uh, when other people, you know, affirm you with their their words. I'm going to get you out of here on this. Uh, what gets you excited and motivated for the future? Yeah, I'm 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 in my mid 40s and I'm one of the older people in the company. And the idea that um, we can impact the next generation of workers, mm-hmm. the, uh, like I, that's what really gets me excited. I love. The idea that there are going to be people coming to Simple Modern, um, some for their first job, and that they're going to get an idea of like business can be really redemptive. Business can be different. some something that is different so that that is uh, it's going to pour into your life that you're going to grow as a person that you're going to that you're that we're not going to reinforce the idea that life is about a, a, a attaining things but about serving others. That gets me really excited. The idea that people can come from other, other industries or other businesses and they have an idea of what business can look like. And then they get here and they're like, Oh, it can be like this. So being a leader in an organization where that's true, it gets me really excited. Chris, thanks for all of your thoughts. I think that your wisdom and your growth mindset really came through and it's obvious why you've been so successful in a number of different roles. That's it for this episode. Thank you for joining us on Scaling for Good. Yeah.